Hey everyone. So this was a discussion on the state of integral theory, which is a philosophical framework we found really useful uh, in the past in Rebel Wisdom. Hopefully the conversation's pretty accessible, but I thought it was worth giving a couple of key concepts that might be useful to frame the dialogue. So firstly, the idea of the four quadrants of knowledge and experience, split between individual and collective, internal and external, and how each needs a different way of engaging and understanding. And also the idea of developmental levels, which first came from spiral dynamics. So the relevant ones for this conversation, modernism, rationality and science, which is coded orange under spiral dynamics, and postmodernism, known as green, which brings in multiple perspectives, but also relativism. So enough intro, and I hope you enjoy the conversation. We're really grateful to be joined by Lehman Pascal and Bruce Alderman, who host a podcast called The Integral Stage. For, for those who aren't familiar, so familiar, Integral Theory is a creation mainly of Ken Wilber, and it was it is still, I'd say, really influential in certainly the circles, uh, Facebook groups that I take part in. It was very, very influential in a lot of kind of intellectual and spiritual circles, especially I'd say the high point was probably um, the early 2000s. Um, we did an interview with Ken Wilber now a couple of years ago. And it, as I say, it's still really heavily influence, influential. I'd love to start maybe by just kind of giving a, a, a really open space to Layman and Bruce to talk about, um, yeah, where do you feel it is now? Um, in it's just a short summary of where you feel like integral is is at now um in 2021 well um my personal take is that it's in a place that's much more um focused on what we call the lower right quadrant but the systemic elements logistics politics i think it's got a strong focus on embodiment and enactment now there's a lot of pressure in the community to make that be the focus. I think there's a lot of a shift towards moral embodiment of stage-like development rather than just a cognitive mapping system. And obviously, Ken's still around, right? We owe him a huge debt, but uh, it's been years since a lot of those ideas were developed, and he's an old guy. So everybody's aware that this is moving into a broader place than that. And I think that broadening and that unpacking and the adaptation of integral to different kinds of problems in the world and to people's lives and into relationships with its cousin communities, I think is where it's at right now. Before our talk, I did a Google Trends search just to see how integral theory and Ken Wilber are doing in terms of uh, measurable metrics in terms of uh, popular searches and things like that. And there's definitely been a steady decline over the last 20 years. Um, it's actually, if you're looking only in the US, searches for Ken Wilber or integral theory have just steadily declined. If you look globally, it's not quite as steep. If you look for one of my favorite topics, which is integral spirituality, there's not even enough metrics on there to show up. <laughs> um, so there was, as David mentioned, kind of a, a peak of activity, I think, in terms of like public awareness and popularity around the 2000s. And it's, it's picking up again, as Wilbur has had some recent publications in 2017, and he's doing uh, podcasts again with the Ken Show on Integral Life. Uh, but my sense now is similar to what Lehman said, is that there's a kind of decentering going on. A lot of people in the integral community call it a diaspora where people are not feeling a need really to focus on you know, Ken Wilber or that established set of, of books and teachings and get on with the practice of application and research and scholarship. And uh, I think there's actually a great deal of activity going on all over the world. Um, there are programs in different universities, there's projects all over the world, uh, but I think possibly the integral community could do a better job of making those things known. Uh, right now, a lot of them are under the radar. Yeah, I'd be curious to hear the flip side. You know, we're, we're talking now about the way Integral is sort of declining or at least de kind of decentering from where it was. 
but it'd be nice to talk a bit and give people some context, especially if they're not so familiar with Integral about what was so exciting about it in those early 2000s. Like for me, I came across it in, I think, 2005 and I was in university and it was kind of like spirituality for nerds in a way um, for me personally. And it was the first time I could kind of map certain experiences or, or map the whole, yeah, or just kind of, let's say the first time I had the idea that, oh, spirituality can, can be something more than just a hazy internal experience. It can be mapped. That's just one element of it, of course. And there's also a, a sense-making element of it, of being able to have a map of reality that's as, as full as possible in any given moment. So be, be nice to hear from you guys. Like what, you know, what really excited you about it? You know, what was special about it at its, at its peak? Well, I can, I can speak personally, which is that I had a number of um, profound seeming internal experiences at one point in my life. And it was like I had a huge additional amount of internal space and I was super thirsty for uh, to fill that space with anything that looked like it acknowledged and went beyond postmodernism. Uh, that took plurality and relativism and deconstruction and intersection. I took that really seriously, incorporated that, but tried to get to a more integrated, more universal, more functional place with it. So I was absorbing philosophers who were all sort of doing that or maybe doing that. And so I came across Ken Wilber, who actually I'd known about when I was a kid. I read some Ken Wilber books as a kid and thought, oh, yeah, of course, and then moved on. But now I was hungry for it, and I saw that there was a language to describe this shift there. And so I got involved initially because I just wanted to make sure that I understood that language and could talk that language. Um, but then what I found was, and this was my real underlying emotional question, was, are, are these my people? Right. And what I found was a certain percentage of them definitely are. This is the community space in which I want to be where people are interested in a multidimensional, full-spectrum developmental attempt to incorporate and go beyond where we are as a civilization. So for me personally, that's that's the minimum requirement for the kind of community in which I feel okay. <laughs> I also had come across Ken Wilber when I was young, and initially I didn't like his books, uh, I thought, how can you map spirit? How can you chart spirit? And I was turned off by that. Um, but then I ended up heading overseas and I spent many years at different monasteries and ashrams in Asia, um, in a number of different countries and did a lot of intensive practice and returned to the United States with an intention to integrate some of that experience with my own Western education and my own Western vocational interests. And by chance, I came across Ken Wilber's books again and found that they actually provided what I was seeking internally from my own experience of how do we bring the best together of, of thinking from, you know, traditional contemplative traditions and modern scientific and postmodern orientations and, and possibly move beyond the limitations of those. Um, I, I never was interested in interested in or on board with really the the kind of sometimes integral is is criticized for being a little bit too self-absorbed and inflationary that we've got the answer for everything and that never attracted me but i did really feel that there was a lot of potential there for bringing together and synthesizing multiple perspectives in a holistic way that could really serve broad human development um, and so yeah that reignited my interest and I tried to seek out an education um, in that. Uh, I couldn't find it exactly, but I found something in transpersonal psychology. And I knew Ken Wilber had been very um, influential in transpersonal psychology. So I took that route and was able to um, incorporate that. And then later, actually, integral degree programs were birthed and uh, they, they're, they're still existing. Hmm. Yeah, there's a, lo there's a lot of things that I'd love if we could touch on and get through before we get to the Q&A. One of one of which is this, this question of what kinds of people are being attracted to Integral. And the, I know that you put a, a, a post on, on Facebook asking for questions and thoughts from the Integral community. One of, and this is one of the, the key topics in, in culture now, kind of diversity and the sense of like which perspectives are being included. And I think I'd love to, to do a deep dive on that in a, in a moment. The question of we are 
integral certainly seems to be a lot of kind of geeky white guys trying to kind of put the world to rights from their minds. Um, and that's a really interesting kind of, it, it, it certainly seems to attract people from that demographic and whether that is an issue in itself is something I'd love to go into. And that kind of speaks to a lot of the kind of cultural hot button issues at the moment. Um, and I think Integral also has a really interesting map to try and make sense of that, that we'll come to. But the, the first question I have is like my, we went and we, we did a, um, we did an interview with Ken. I kind of got a sense of like the Integral industry and my sense is that some of the, because whenever you build an industry around any kind of philosophy or any kind of set of thought, I think you start to create incentive. The reason I think that I, that I reached out to you two is that you're enough on the fringes of it to understand and to see what's going on in the community, but I feel that you maybe have more uh, opportunity to speak freely. I think, you know, and it's true, Bruce and I are in our, uh, a unique position because um, we are... Uh, we have a lot of sympathies with a lot of different factions within the community. And we've also set up this podcasting set of series in which now I've talked to, you know, e every kind of integralist high and low. <laughs> so I've got a pretty good sense of what it is. Before I address your question, I want to say, I want to just remind everybody that it's not exactly obvious what this word means, integral. Like we're using it like we know what we're talking about, but it has a kind of, it has to at least two sets of meanings. Sometimes I say integralist and integralite. And for me, an integralist is somebody who regardless of their internal structure understands and has heard about and can talk in the terms of this theoretical model. And an integral light is somebody who sees the things and experiences the things that this model is talking about, whether they've heard about it or not. So where I think the we need to go, and I think where we are going, is a large number of communities consist of people who see and experience those dynamic patterns, and they're finding each other across their different terminological conceptual differences. Um, to your question, yes, I feel very free to speak my mind. Now, that's partly temperamental. I'm usually willing to take communication risks. Maybe not everybody is. Other people might feel that pressure differently. But I think for some time now, the so-called integral community has been so diverse, so full of factions, and so um, full of interesting characters that I think everybody is pretty comfortable expressing themselves. I don't, I don't think there's any sense of suppression and there's certainly very little sense of, you know, like a, a late nineties feeling that you have to toe the party line. I feel very few people feel like they're brand ambassadors anymore. I think there was a, a shift in some of the early integral theory conferences where possibly the, the very first integral theory conference in the US was very Wilbur centric. Uh, but beyond that, there was a concerted effort to really expand out and bring in more critical voices and really, I think, be more balanced in the approach. I don't feel any sense of restriction either. I think some of the things that we talk about on our program and ex explore on the integral stage are probably things that would not be aired on integral life. So there is some kind of uh, limitation on what can be shared on the exactly the can centered um, communication platforms because they're, they're really wanting to focus on putting forward Ken's vision and message. And, and there's less of an interest in bringing in outside perspectives um, to the degree that we're wanting to do with, um, you know, our, our YouTube channel. Yeah. So that, that point around um, the, the sort of disembodied quality. I mean, there's, there's lots of things I think integral misses, but when we, um, had Jamie Wheel on talking about this. He, he I think he called it something like a disembodied eggheads playing and being Jedi, uh, which is a funny way to say it. I mean, is that it sounds like that's that's kind of what you're saying. And I guess we all have kind of some some element of that. Um, but is there an embodiment? I mean, you mentioned before, you know, this movement towards this kind of deeper embodiment of actually putting this stuff into practice. And I mean, I'm curious about that because. Traditionally, it's been hard to see that in, in integral, to really make that link between integral then being played out in the world and, and being used in different areas. I mean, have you seen that? Are you seeing that? Or is it still, is that the next step for integral? Yeah, I would just say that although there is a, um, 
the fact that people feel like embodiment is the next step indicates that they sense there was an insufficiency of embodiment before. And I think that's not just in the intro community. That's also in uh, a number of other higher discourse communities where people are trying to solve civilization and developmental problems. Uh, however, uh, there is also an issue around how you access this stuff and understand it and how it gets communicated. Because if you drop into a verbal text-based uh, community around ideas, you're going to get very word-heavy, idea-focused conversations. You can't help that. If you pick up a book on a philosophy, you're going to get a verbal readout of a philosophy. And that might be how you come into it, but you're, you're not going to see the person. You're not seeing the people who are working every day in their lives to work with the stuff that may might be expressed by those ideas. So when we take a sampling, we get an overly intellectual, overly disembodied version of that phenomenon. Like what counts as integral? Is it people doing it in their yards and their kitchens? Yes, that absolutely counts, but we don't register that because we register when somebody writes a book or makes a lecture and talks about it. So I think there's a, we have to weight that appropriately ourselves, although there clearly is a need to be more embodied. Mm, I just I wonder as well as as you're you're both talking, you know, integral at one point, Al Gore was into it, Alanis Morissette, it had this cultural capital. But if I look at the influence of integral from what you were talking about there, Bruce, and those kind of small projects, it's what Ken talked about us to us as well. Uh, you know, it was very small scale, very kind of experimental. Compared to the impact that like intersectionality and uh, wokeness has had on culture, where it's in every HR department, it's it's in every single, almost every movie, every TV show, it just strikes me that integral is very sophisticated and very difficult to explain. We've spent ages trying to explain integral and try and boil it down. You know, we've spent long, long time doing that, um, and that's tough. It's difficult to simplify it. Whereas, you know, certain things with more of a mimetic pull. Um, are much easier to say. It's, it's, it's all about power and oppression. And if you want to get on board and you want to be a, a, a carrier of this meme, you need three talking points and you're good to go. With Integral, it's like, okay, well, whoa, there's, there's Aqual and there's this, and you got to know the difference between states and stages. And actually, let's rewind a second because it's, so I wonder if, if the next stage or a next stage of Integral is a kind of, not even just embodiment, but something that's simplifying and making it emotionally resonant because that's what I think intersectionality has for all of its misguidedness, in my view, it's got an emotional resonance to it. I think that's uh, it's true, uh, but there's two there's two ways forward for integral, and they both have to happen. One is to make it simpler and more engaging, and the other is to make it more nuanced and more complex, right? So we have to go like we need to move the ideas to their next level, and that's going to take an enormous amount of richness and effort, and it's going to be strange. <laughs> On the other hand, we need to access people, which means it has to be simple and emotional, and different people are going to have to specialize in different functions. Yeah, Layman and I just have been talking about working on a book together, and so that is probably pretty much guaranteed to be strange and uh, <laughs> difficult to digest for many people. Um, but yeah, I, I agree that there have, has to be concurrent efforts uh, to translate um, to the community. I think there's a risk when you popularize ideas too much and too quickly is that they get picked up by people um, without maybe the preparation for actually embodying and integrating what they actually entail. And then they get applied in a more simplified form that may be actually counterproductive. And I think, for instance, intersectionality is an example of that. Yeah, I would just like to say a couple more things about that because the model itself sort of suggests exactly what you're talking about, right? Is that people are moving into green, postmodern, pluralistic, deconstructionist, intersectional thinking. That's going to happen before they get to an integrative version of that same relativistic critique, right? So they're going to have to get that first. There's no way we're going to supersede that. Uh, the model predicts that they would have to grow through and really enrich that. So I think we have to be ready to receive people who are doing that and to help that phenomenon, that woke phenomenon, be a, an integrally friendly developmental version of what it's trying to do. But I think um, maybe Ken and to some degree people who look at the situation through the lens of 
the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s, I don't think they incorporated as much of the pluralistic critique as they need to. Like it's continuing to evolve and expand, and we have to keep sort of uh, integrating and combining it. So it's going to be powerful. It's going to get more powerful, and people have to be able to do some version of that first before they're aware of the need to bring that back together somehow. One quick follow up on that, just experience, personal experience from that. So I teach in multiple different campuses. And one of the campuses that I teach at, uh, the largest, I think, contingent, um, you know, among students uh, come from the LGBTQ community. And we have a lot of, um, you know, activists and, uh, uh, you know, also trans students um, in our classes. And integral is famously rejected, you know, by, you know, a lot of people in the, the so-called green postmodern community and criticized. But in my experience of teaching it, especially in, in this campus, but elsewhere too, I found that without ever addressing, you know, um, you know, the topics that they're immediately concerned with, but just going through the full, uh, you know, set of ideas in as embodied and uh, practical way as I can. Um, I've been approached many times by students who are through that beginning to see the limitations of their own discourse, the limitations of some of their own strategies, and are feeling a kind of quickening towards something else that was missing, that they knew was missing, but they weren't able to articulate. So that's been encouraging, even though it's you know a small anecdotal thing. Yeah, you're already pushing into the area that I think is uh, where we might spend the rest, most of the rest of the, the call. As you say, you're kind of already starting to talk about kind of this tension between an in integral terms green and, I mean, the, the, I guess it boils down to which parts of green do we want to integrate? Integral is about integrating and transcending. And what I find really fascinating, so obviously green is radically um, kind of relativistic, so it has an allergy to anything that, that reintroduces hierarchy. And by definition, integral introdu introduces the idea of hierarchy. It's developmental levels. And so there's going to be a tension there. And what I find really intriguing when I look at some of the integral groups online is I, when I look at Ken's work and most recently the Trump and a post-truth world, for me, he lays out the pathologies of the culture really, really well. Like what happens, you end up, if you obliterate all hierarchy, you end up in narcissism, you end up in relativism. And in a way, the paradox for me is that integral, as far as it is kind of oriented with Ken's writing, seems like it should be inoculated against some of the pathologies of the culture. And yet I see some of those same conversations and those same divisions playing out within integral itself. I'd love to hear your reflections on where you feel like because that for me is, is now the fundamental dividing line in culture. And if integral is useful for anything, it's that showing us a place beyond that. So we're not just in pure rejection of green values, of postmodernism, of intersectionality. We can actually hold, hold the, the values of that, of that worldview without falling prey to maybe some of the ideological traps or the kind of redu reducto al absurdum of some of the kind of cultural dynamics we're seeing play out. So where do you see that fundamental kind of dividing line in culture and how is that playing out in integral itself? Well, I think the uh, within the community and conversation that we might call integral, you're going to get all kinds of different people who are coming from different places. And I think one of the things that in my mind is more and more obvious to the community is that these distinctions and stages are stylistic rather than content based, right? Two people can show up and they can talk about integral and they can be coming from very different levels, right? To be integral is not to be able to use integral words. It's to have a style of behavior and a set of structures that we would want to describe by those terms. And the, the same thing is true at the um, green intersectional pluralistic consciousness is a lot of people who profess the ideas around that are not really there. 
right? Their moral and aesthetic and emotional understanding doesn't match up with the words they're using. Because once you make some words, that's just a tool. And our so our model is anybody at any level can use any tool. You can, right? Primitives can't build a nuclear bomb, but they could certainly get one and set one off. Likewise, the concept of intersectionality, you may have to at least partially get into that pluralist consciousness to create that concept. But once it exists, it can be given to anybody who's coming from any level. So you're going to have modernist intersectionality and dogmatic primitive intersectionality. And so it's important to separate out those different forms and also to ask ourselves, are there things in the current environment that are causing people to regress down that hierarchy of inclusion, right? Pathological elements that make those interesting new concepts show up in unhealthy ways. So that's all on one side. And the other side is, yeah, there's, it's, it's insufficient. Pluralism is insufficient. There's a need to go beyond it. The way Ken Wilber phrased things might have been a little hasty, a little simplistic. Maybe there wasn't as much pluralism then. But also when you want to distinguish something, you say, I have a new thing. I, so I'm obviously going to be incentivized to distinguish it from the previous thing. Right. So people who want to be yellow or teal, there's a real strong incentive to like separate yourself from green, to objectify it and in a way to belittle it so that you can move on. And that's appropriate. But we need to understand that this green culture still exists and is still evolving and we have to enfold it. And that the people who speak in these terms are not necessarily at that stage of development. So only some of them are green. The rest of them are modernist or dogmatic or, you know, however we would like to characterize those developmental phases. I think there have possibly been a couple missteps, you know, in the integral formation in terms of the emerging community uh, since, you know, maybe 2005 especially, or, or a little bit before that, when they were first launching some of the integral media platforms. And Ken Wilber at that time said, if you read and understand my work, you are integral. And I think that was a misleading message. Um, it, it's actually not the case. And it's easy to read those books and pick up something from them and use the language and not really inhabit the sensibility that birthed them, just as, as Lehman is talking about too. So I agree with that, that with that, that critique about, you know, intersectionality or green, and not everyone is intersectionalist, you know, in that community is, is actually at that um, cognitive stage of development. The same is true in integral theory. And I think some of the fault lines we find in integral theory um, in the integral community um, are due to, you know, different developmental um, stages. Uh, grasping onto these ideas and using them in different ways. But it's not only that, there are also typological and other kinds of differences that are leading to some of the, um, you know, the splits and the divisions and the, you know, the kind of the tension, cultural tension that exists currently, you know, and it's mirrored in this community and unfortunately hasn't proved to be inoculated against that as one might have hoped. But I think part of that is because indeed the integral community does not consist of um, everybody um, being at the same level um, of individuals who are at the same level of of development or, or you know sophistication of appreciation of those ideas. And I think regarding green, uh, uh, an essay came out many years back by I think Gary Hampson. I think it was called uh, "The Way Out Is the Way Through," and he was really looking at how integral interprets green. And you know, Layman was mentioning that there's some you know, necessity of, of distancing yourself from green and, you know, through critique in order to move on to, uh, you know, a different view. And I think that's true. But I think also in, in the broader community, maybe not so much among, you know, some of the people who are very serious about integral, but in the broader community, there hasn't really actually been adequate digestion of green before hurrying on and trying to occupy a different space. Yeah, I want to ask... So in the conversation that we had with Ken, and obviously this has come up a lot uh, with Rebel Wisdom, um, that this question of like what, what parts of green to integrate, and we had a, obviously an original focus on 
Jordan Peterson and what the phenomenon of Jordan Peterson said about culture. And for me and for Ken, when we spoke to him, it was really about these sort of traditional values that had been forgotten or erased or just not valued in sort of post-modernity. And he was really bringing back those traditional values. And Ken said, well, Integral sees what's missing. That's the that's kind of how, he, and and for me, that that was certainly true. Like it was a sense of, yeah, we've, we've lost our way to some degree. There are some timeless truths about humanity that Jordan Peterson is speaking to, and this is coming back. But I would also admit that personally, I have a little bit of a green allergy. Like I probably overreact to some parts of that. I think we all um, probably have some allergies in some areas. But the key question, I guess, is how do you see these dynamics playing out in, in integral? Where do you think What's your answer to that question of what parts of traditionalism have we not integrated and we need to integrate? What parts of green are we not integrating that we need to integrate? Where, where would you reflect that? Because I know, Layman, we spoke a little while ago and you asked me that question about rebel wisdom. And maybe we can dive a little bit more into that when maybe we do a reverse conversation on your, on your show. But, but I'm interested in that, that, getting down to that sort of... Um, yeah, that that fault line. Where do you see those those pieces playing out? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I think very pertinent to the moment of history that we find ourselves in. Uh, I I do a lot of work around what I call like meta progressive politics. Um, Steve McIntosh calls it post progressive, or there's different ways to think about that. But that idea is. There's something really important about what's coming forward in these pluralistic communities, which are to some degree real and to some degree superficial and inhabited by people who don't actually understand those terms. The ideas they're bringing forward, I think, in general, are all good. What we need to integrate is all of the parts of that. But what we need to be able to do is say, here's what a balanced version of that looks like. Here's what a healthy version of that looks like. So integral consists of a number of, of like it's like Ken was saying, it's what's missing, right? It's it's the things you need to include that if you don't include those things, you're going to get a distorted outcome, right? And so one thing is how Ken packaged those things, integral theory. The other thing is, yeah, those are the things. You can just imagine them taken out of the package and put in a sack. And, and lots of other communities also recognize those things, those types of perspectives. So we need those. But among those are development, among those are health, among those are conscious and unconscious, among those are left and right. So when we look at green, first of all, we have to understand it appropriately, which is um, what's actual green and what's non-green using green terms. And then what's green look like on multiple developmental intelligence lines and how does it become healthy, which is to be able to enact those lines in tandem with each other without regressing, and to be able to do that in a way that encompasses the types of people, right, which are masculine and feminine, it's left and right, it's the big five, it's all the basic types. So if we're looking from a meta perspective to favor and help green because we need it, we want to say, all of those components, all those ideas are correct. But here is the left and right version of that idea. Here is the healthy and unhealthy version of that idea. And here is some help and encouragement to bring a simultaneously left and right healthy version forward to make a bridge to what's on the other side. Yeah, I think I'd add two things to that. A while back, I talked to Ali about uh, the notion of a regression in the service of transcendence and my sense that that seems to be happening culturally at this time. Um, psychologically, it's a period, usually a period of existential crisis that leads to um, a lifting of uh, certain repression barriers that we had been carrying and the surfacing of older forms of consciousness that can temporarily overwhelm. Um, it can be seen as, you know, a pathological regressive movement, but I think the integral approach would want to see some of what's manifesting as a, at least an opportunity to fold in what is erupting um, by recognizing 
what are authentic values and concerns and needs that are being expressed, even if they're showing up pathologically or, or destructively or um, in immature ways right now. Nevertheless, there may be uh, elements that need to be folded in and acknowledged that are not being properly acknowledged. Um, and that's why there's this, um, this fissure and, and this eruption. And in terms of, you know, things to carry forward from, you know, green, I think there's, you know, many, many different things. One that I have emphasized in my own work is just uh, the, the insight into pluralism, and which we, you know, Integral has its own way of unpacking, but uh, that we would want to look at, you know, maybe what Greg Thomas is calling rooted cosmopolitanism or um, integral pluralism. Uh, if you look religiously, there's been a movement, you know, there's a kind of exclusivism at uh, traditional, uh, you know, within traditional frames where, you know, there's the in-group and out-group, and that's very clearly defined. Um, a more modernist approach is more inclusive, where it would want to fold other, you know, people from other communities into the, the central guiding vision. But it usually, through that inclusion, privileges its own position and then wants to include the others in some kind of subordinate role. Um, pluralism recognizes kind of the hegemonic and, and colonialist <laughs> tendencies that, that, you know, are present in that move and looks to, you know, actually liberate people along their own, you know, cultural trajectories and not enfold them only in one single master narrative. And I think there's something of value in that. And some of the green criticism of Integral has been, it seems like it's doing that modernist move of including them all within a single master vision that colonializes them and, and, and subordinates them. And so I think the, I think the, the work for, for Integral um, that, that's been going on and, and still needs to go on is actually uh, a way that actually can honor the multiple forms of expression and recognize the truths within each um, that's not merely relativistic, but that can, that can actually find um, factors that uh, inform these movements that are all you know, analogs of each other or homeomorphic equivalents of each other that are, are you know, um, worth recognizing and worth honoring in their distinctness. Yeah, I'd like to just add one thing about um, the role that conservative feelings and ideas and world spaces play in regard to this, which is um, integral, but also pluralist, green, postmodern, have left and right polarizations. And so I don't think there's been an adequate integration into progressive um, you know, democratic socialists, deconstructive pluralist, they haven't incorporated their right wing properly, right? What is a right wing pluralist? It's Nietzsche, it's Joe Rogan. There's, there's a lot of sort of solid, old fashioned, virtue demonstrating uh, conservative pushback in spaces that are cognitively pluralistic and relativistic. So Pluralism needs to incorporate its left and right wing together much better, but it also has to incorporate what we think of as amber blue traditional society values in a much better way, because a lot of people are in that place. That's rural, agrarian, uh, the sense that we should be ruled by an authoritarian monarch-like figure and that we've got to let go of a lot of this liberal nonsense and we've got to be more nationalistic, right? That's a serious thing. And if we don't incorporate that thing, we're going to continually get sabotaged by reactive ethno-nationalists because they are accurately pointing out that something is missing. And if you want to get, as I do, some progressive cultural changes, some system upgrades, then you're going to have to have the spirit of conservatives on board. Rural, traditional, I grew up in that kind of world. And so I feel very strongly that it's essential to fold that flavor in. And also, it's important to understand that it is a flavor because what we call rational modernism, orange, right? It does a double checking move. It does reason. It does science, has this strategic approach to making language meaningful. 
But before that, language was more symbolic, more evocative, more affective. And there's a lot of things that uh, traditional rural people need that are actually flavor. They're actually aesthetic. They need symbolic recognition. And it's it's perfectly feasible to think of progressive systemic upgrades with emotional symbolic recognition of the virtues and values applicable to traditional people. Mm. You just, yeah, I think that's really well said. Um, and we, for me, it feels like we, we in, in some sense, could be circling back to somewhere where we started. You were talking about this desire in the community to be more embodied, which is such a hazy term, but that there is a, a term I think is an integral and is very important and necessary for all of this to happen, which is the, the shadow, understanding those aspects of ourselves that we cut off and reject. And for people who identify themselves as progressive, you know, we've been talking about this on the channel for ages and, and we're largely inspired by Ken as well in Trump and the post truth world. Progressives need to own their traditionalist shadows and, and the many other shadows and, and vice versa. And so, and you know, we uh, we've spoken to Doshin Roshi on the channel, Diane Musha Hamilton. Um, Doshin said one time to us when we were in Denver, he was like, you know, my my dojo is like uh, not dojo, sorry, <laughs> but um, the uh, the integral Zen um, uh, place is is just down the road from Ken's loft. But but so many people don't come here. This is you know, from from his perspective, it's a very upper left thing. But it's like. That is the work, that the work is for all of us to find those aspects where we have an allergy, we're in a strong rejection, and it's gritty, dirty work, but amazing as well. And I think this kind of highly cognitive version of integral is, is some, some, I think it's kind of emotional avoidance or can be an emotional avoidance of doing that down and dirty work. So I'm, I'm very curious to see how that starts playing out in the integral community. And it, may, it might have to get a little bit messy and scrappy as, as some of the Facebook groups are, actually. Yeah, and I, I, mean, and so I was going to add that as well, Layman, because I know that we've touched on this before. Masculinity, like the, 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 the cultural conversation around masculinity and those masculine virtues, I think is right at the core of this. And also the sense of integrating, integrating like healthy aggression, healthy anger. And that for me is like at the core of, certainly the left sh shadow it, and um yeah it feels like that conversation and I, I i'm also interested like how much of that is under is underneath all of the kind of cultural dynamics that we're seeing like how much of it is ultimately a kind of yin yang masculine feminine kind of dynamic playing out at the level of culture which is another really fascinating um lens that we can use yeah, you and I talked a little bit about the problem of the difficulty of integrating aggression in, in the pluralistic experience. Uh, and while I think that's very true, it, we can also get carried away with that analysis. Like, it, it is a little bit odd for four intellectual white guys to be sitting here wondering whether there's not enough emphasis on the masculine. <laughs> no. <laughs> right? So we have to treat these things in a complex way. Uh, nonetheless, there is a problem with uh, certain demonizations of aggression and masculinity within some of the progressive conversations. So we have to take that into account. But I think there's an important thing here about broadening. I mean, that's my general theme, right? Broadening the things Ken says need to be included, broadening that beyond Ken's model, broadening the community beyond itself to interface with other communities and broadening the definitions, broadening our sense of the definitions, because cognition can sound like you're talking about intellectual recognition, like you're just a scholastic test is going to be given, and can you recognize these patterns? And sometimes that is what it means, but the way Ken's trying to use it, the way I want him to be trying to use it, is much richer, that cognition is your ability, your bodied existential capacity to work with some pattern as if you recognize it, right? And what we know about the brain is most of our cognition is subconscious and it has multiple dimensions. It has feelings, it has thoughts, it has things that are linear, things that are nonlinear. So we have to understand when we hear someone talk about cognitive development, that really it's a, it 
potentially a much more interesting, complex thing that isn't in the front recognition, consciousness, waking mode, but actually touches on all this stuff. And you mentioned the shadow. That's why I'm saying this, which is that's the zone in which things are going on. Our development is primarily subconscious cognitive development, and the subconscious is inhibited by certain patterns and shadows. It could be things that are being left out. It could be things that it needs, could be things that it sees backwards, but we have to be able to work in the area, the part of ourselves that we're not recognizing in order to actually do this rather than just talking about it. So we are coming very close to the time where we're going to flip to the Q&A section. If you um, haven't been following the chat, if you could uh, maybe go and have a look at the questions and add your initials to upvote any of the questions that you particularly want asked. Um, before we do that, I just want to invite Layman or Bruce, is there anything that you think um, we should have talked about that we haven't talked about yet? Not necessarily, but uh, I'd say something is I've been away at the cabin for two days for my birthday. And something that's been on my mind out there is our relationship to our elders, right? And so at this point, Ken Wilbur is one of those. Not everybody who's old is one of our elders, but if people are interested in human development and they're interested in incorporating, but also going beyond the pluralistic dimension of the current society, and they wanna acknowledge shadow and they wanna acknowledge the multiple dimensions of ourselves, um, then this is one of our elders. And I personally, I'm talking to a lot of people on these various series. And when I talk to one of the older ones, I want to appreciate that whatever, you know, whatever our experiential or intellectual or temperamental differences are, these are elders in our community and they deserve our acknowledgement and respect because we have a lot to learn from them and we don't even know all the ways in which we can learn from them. So I think it's really important for us to, um, venerate the people who have tried to do the general kind of thing that we collectively are trying to do. <laughs> I think one thing I would add, and we did touch on it, but I think kind of what's up for the integral community that I feel is a reaching out to kin communities and um, efforts to um, dialogically engage with, um, mutually enrich uh, different kinds of um, communities that are emphasizing different things from complex thought to critical realism to the intellectual dark web or the intellectual deep web of, of synthism, um, metamodernism, game B. You know, I think they're all bumping up into similar um, spaces in terms of sets of social concerns and, and uh, uh, kind of awarenesses of the limitations of, of you know, past cultural memes. And so I think that that uh, kind of decentering from from necessarily just aqua model, but really looking at interfacing with the broader meta community, um, is is really what's up uh, right now, and that feels most exciting and fruitful for me. Awesome, great. Yes. That's a really nice segue into some of the questions we've got coming up. So um, if if you want to turn your camera on, you can. Uh, it'd be nice to see some faces, and we will invite you to, to unmute yourself and ask your question. And we will start with the most upvoted question, which is from Lisa Norton. Yeah, hi, um, thank you so much. That was, this has been wonderful. I just, I think my question, I'll, you've talked so much about it already, so I'm not sure if it's as timely as it was, but maybe has some things in common with um, what Bruce just said and what Graham put in the chat. I was originally thinking about John Gebser and even Ken himself has said that uh, he didn't use the metamodern language of structure of feeling. But um, I guess I should read my question was, um, please elaborate on the integral light structures of feeling regardless of labels and terminologies. Um, I think even Ken said this, that um, speaking, speaking 
in terms of developmental cognition from that bias, then this is an evolutionary emergence that's coming online globally, regardless of what names we might give it. I I don't know how many people might have caught Jonathan Rousen's um, wonderful talk in the STOA yesterday, but I think what I would put out there as a conversation provocation is that um, we're, I still feel in, in this conversation that we're assuming a shared object, that we mean the same thing when we talk about integral. And um, so Jonathan, you know, it's easy for a late, late stage cognizer to kick the models to the curb after studying them thoroughly. So I would say there is a certain fashionableness to uh, being anti-model. And I think that says a lot about the complexity and urgency of the times. I'll leave it at that. Well, hi, Lisa. Uh, I, I work with Jonathan on a metamodern anthology project, so I know him really well. And um, I guess what stands out to me from that question is the notion of thinking of these stage-like transformations as being felt qualities, right? And that, un there, I mean, personally, that's a bit temperamental, like certain temperaments will experience it more cognitively and certain ones will experience it more affectively. But I think we all are keyed into something that's pre-intellectual and pre-cognitive about these stages. So they have different moods and the so-called second tier stages also have their characteristic moods. And these are often part of its novel, part of its emergent, and part of its a hybridization, which is that each one can take the moods of the previous one and mix them in a new way. So I think we are, these communities are collectively feeling something in common about the way all the parts we have, which are all felt parts, might be able to be integrated together. Right. Um... The next most upvoted question was Graham, Graham Pilger. First of all, thanks for, thanks for coming and talking about this. It's a, a really uh, fascinating topic. Um, yeah, and so you, you've definitely touched on some of some pieces of the question that I wrote, uh, but I was asking, um, do you see the intellectual dark web as an indication of a revival of integral thinking? And then sort of alongside that, like after seeing that movement fall apart more or less, um, what needs to change about integral theory or the culture at large for a more sustainable integral conversation to infect the culture in the same way that postmodernism has in recent years after sort of being on the back burner since the 60s and 70s? I think there were aspects of the intellectual dark web that were you know, integral in spirit. I wouldn't say all of the players or, or elements of it um, matched my sense of integral, but definitely some did. And it was refreshing um, to see because it was, you know, being approached from a different angle. Um, and and I think one of the things that I th integral can learn is really to engage with with you know the topics that are most pressing culturally right now, and, and that it it often remains a little bit ab abstract and aloof and focuses more on um, you know spiritual topics. Um, or it will venture into political ones, but uh, it hasn't done very well, I think, in 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 wrestling uh, directly and publicly, um, you know, w with some of the prominent voices in the community with the the issues that are are confronting us right now, such as you know Jordan Peterson taking on certain questions and issues, um, and that that integral uh, thinkers have, for whatever reason, not really ventured into those territories uh, as directly or, or maybe as, you know, with as much risk taking <laughs> as, as Peterson did and, uh, you know, um, the Weinsteins and, and some others did. Yeah, I mean, the notion of whether something has fallen apart, whether it's the IDW or the intro community, it's really uncertain because its effectiveness in the world is going to take a long time to evaluate and it's mostly going to show up in forms that aren't identified with the label and i'm personally i'm i'm very encouraged by that right the the spread of the parts of the integral worldview 
it almost comes at the expense of people acknowledging and calling it that, right? It's, it's about the reality of how those patterns move into the world and not about whether people are searching for that word online. On the Jordan Peterson is fascinating. There's been a conversation for years, Intergal's attempt to evaluate Jordan Peterson, right? He's like, what level is he at? And it very often depends on who's doing it, how much information they know, whether they're leaning right or left in themselves. But clearly, Jordan Peterson has an awareness and a critique of postmodern pluralism, which many of the people in the IDW have. Now, whether that critique means they're operating from a higher level or whether they're like, you know, the term a self-loathing Jew, right? There's there's a there's self-negating postmodernists, right? Is Jordan Peterson beyond postmodernism or is he a self-loathing pluralist? It's hard to say, <laughs> right? Both of those are potentially useful interpretations. But I think in general, the IDW has had uh, a certain conservative limitation, right? A certain unwillingness to see elements of the political progressive agenda that are very important and a certain generalized temperamental uh, element that really attracts certain people and puts other people off. Nonetheless, I think they definitely are, they've been an important piece of the conversation for a few years. And they're recognizing what's going on in the world and they're suggesting critiques and some of them more than others are probably integral thinkers, integral feelers, integral understanders. Bruce, did you want to say something? I've got a lot to say to this, so I, I'll, <laughs> but I'll wait until you've... Okay. Yeah, I was just going to jump in with a comment that that's pretty much what happened to psychosynthesis. Psychosynthesis was really, you know, well ahead of its time and developed a lot of practices and techniques and perspectives. And it didn't end up propagating very strongly as its own movement, but a lot of its orientations and insights and tools got picked up and, and, and flowered in many other different areas. And if you look around multiple transpersonal um, schools of thought and, and, and other humanistic psychological schools of thought, a lot of them have borrowed from psychosynthesis without acknowledging it, but they're using the insights from Asajoli. And I think in some ways that's happening in part right now, even with the, you know, the movements that are, are currently you know, active and gaining maybe more attention with metamodernism and game B. And there are definitely players in those circles who are drawing from integral and using those tools without really giving that name to it. But nevertheless, you know, the inspiration has been there. And, you know, I think it's, it's a insight that's been genuinely owned and digested and is being deployed in the ways that, you know, these individuals see fit. So it's a spreading of, of, you know, integral thinking, but not with the integral label. Hmm. Yeah, I just wanted to say to the the question about the intellectual dark web, because I I fir I think I first wrote that was actually why we got in contact with with Ken originally, is he read a piece that I wrote that included uh, describing the intellectual dark web as a nascent integral conversation. I think I was quite careful to say a nascent integral conversation because I think what constellated it originally was a resistance to it was a kind of resistance to green saying there is a problem here and we're identifying it. And that was pretty much the main alliance between the people within it. And I, you saw this kind of resistance of a lot of people within it to kind of move beyond that, move beyond the critique to solutions. There was a really fascinating um, conversation between Eric Weinstein and Jordan Peterson on the Dave Rubin report where you could see the frustration that Peterson was just getting into a well-worn critique of kind of crazy postmodernism and, and Weinstein was saying, okay, let's come up with some solutions. Let's come up with some solutions to the trans issue. Let's come up with some solutions to these kind of issues that have kind of wrapped us around the axle. And there was a real sense of, and another interesting thing is that both Brett and Eric were, when I first met them, and I asked them about Integral, I was like, are you aware of Integral? This is a really useful model. When you look at kind of Integral versus like the, 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 developmental levels actually, for me, show where resistance to green just becomes, it just comes from a from an orange level or where it's pushing forward to a kind of transcendent include. And I said, this is really useful. And both Brett and Eric initially were very hostile to integral. They were aware of it, but they were kind of like, no, I'm not interested. And independently, both of them 
whether that was for strategic reasons and they realized they had potential allies there that they could work with, or they looked into themselves independently were, came back and said, no, I'm interested. At one point, Eric was interested to meet Ken. Um, he asked me to put him in touch with Ken. And Brett also went from being very resistant to, to being interested in it and interested in kind of learning a bit more about the model. So I do think that, and I think those two were the most forward thinking of, of the members of the IDW at the time. Um, I think Rogan is a, a, a sort of uh, a different case because I think he's actually a more, na more naturally embodied player because I think he's less, in, he's less intellectual. He's kind of, he's much more embodied. He's kind of been punched in the face a lot. He, he thinks very quickly and he, like I'd, I'd say he's almost the most naturally integral person in that constituency because he doesn't get hung up around the intellectual stuff like I think Eric and Brett have. And we could kind of talk about where they get hung up in their own way. And I think there's a lot of incentive structures. There's a lot of audience capture. There's a lot of kind of other issues there that we could go into. But, but I do think it was a nascent conversation that got stuck and did not push forward. It didn't really engage with critics. It didn't really integrate the conversation with the left. It didn't really push that forward. And the idea of how we as a group and you bring in metamodernism, you bring in game B, you bring in integral, like I think we need to start pushing this forward. And I'm interested in how we do that for sure. Yeah, we need to push it forward. And at the same time, it's impossible to really evaluate what these things are, right? 10 years from now, we'll have a very different sense of the IDW than we've had over the last two or three years. So it's all of these things are nascent in some manner. And um, I appreciate what you're saying because there's a huge difference between the Weinstein brothers and Dave Rubin, <laughs> right? So some of right, all these people are at different places in themselves. I like the Weinsteins, I've got a few critiques, but in terms of the structures that they need to reach for in order to describe their emerging insights, those are often very aligned with what Integral is trying to describe. So we have uh, some more really good questions. Next one is Adriana Forte. Hi. Um, th yeah, thank you for this. It was really, really lovely hearing you. I think I need my question. Co let me try to copy it here because I'll... Um, well, basically, what, I'm, what I was pointing to, um, it's that, ironically, it's like this double bind of needing to be at an integral stage of development to be able to really critique integral from a place of not just projecting. So um, that's, that's where I'm sitting with because there's so much critique and some they're not all this they're not all born equal so um the ones that you kind of take into account that's really like they feel they know and they experience integral and from that perspective they can see further and also the ones that actually can't see it at all and they're just in a lower um stage of the rung developmentally speaking and they just project whatever they imagine integral is and um critique it so I'd love to hear you speaking about it. Definitely, I think that's the case, you know, that we do have, uh, you know, critiques of integral, which seem to be uh, very uncomfortable with its postmodern aspects. And uh, I would say that, you know, to the degree that it is uncomfortable with some of the more, um, you could say, postmodern aspects of, of integral theory or if it's if it's unable to digest, you know, any notion of uh, of development or hierarchy that could be productive, um, you know, it could be generative, could be held in a way that actually um, serves growth and serves community and serves relationship, and and can only relate to it uh, as something that's pathological. Then likely it's not coming from a place uh, that can actually see um, the territory that that integral is cognizing. Um, and so I, I think, you know, at the same time, there are perspectives that, you know, are critical of integral where it also, I think, can see uh, where it still engages in maybe carrying over some, some ideas uh, in an incomplete way um, or that, it's, that it has incompletely digested um, past perspectives. And so I think, for instance, some people will criticize the way that integral theory holds 
uh, tribal consciousness or indigenous consciousness as really not allowing for the nuance of development that actually was available um, you know, in those cultures in those times. So yeah, I, I think it, it's whether the critique can basically see what integral sees and then point beyond it, or whether it's just trying to tear down some of its you know, um, pieces uh, without being able to take the uh, more global picture. Yeah, I think there's two, um, there's two kind of issues here. And one is, what does it mean to think about going beyond integral and then the other one is, what does it mean when integral gets critiqued in a way that's reasonable? And so a reasonable critique could come either from your fellows, people who are seeing things at the same level as you, but with a different style and a different emphasis, because Game B has a more technological emphasis and metamodernism has a more sociopolitical emphasis. And they'll sometimes say of integral that it's too psycho-spiritual in its emphasis. And so these might be legitimate critiques at the same level, or they might also be just indicating that each form is going to have a specialization. We need all these specializations to complement each other. And the other question is, is there a beyond integral, right? And that's a little bit ambiguous because you could either say, as integral sometimes does, hey, we're about this and we are proposing that there's stages beyond us, or we could say that it's sort of a, just a, synonym for second tier or a synonym for a whole set of developmental options that if they went beyond, if you could cr legitimately assimilate and embody and understand integral and then critique it, are you then non-integral and you're something else? Or, or are we going to call you what integral means now? So I think there's a way for me personally, I think of integral as just a whole set of stages of understanding most of which have not emerged yet, and all of which are going to grow by critiquing themselves. That's a really nice point. Just something I, I've been wondering recently, and, and we don't really have time to unpack it here, but it's sort of uh, something um, maybe everyone could look into or whoever's interested, is, is how culturally specific integral is. You know, I've been really interested in the work of Joseph Henrik at Harvard, looking at weird psychology, so Western educated industrialized, rich, and democratic, so most of us here. And I'm very struck by just how rigorous that research is and how profoundly different weird psychology is to other more collectivist um, cultures, for example, and how different the value systems are. I'm really curious whether development is also different in those cultures and to see what studies have actually been done around, you know, that's a real, that's a critique I'd love to see, but that critiques the whole validity of developmental theory to begin with. Um, and I'd love to get, I'd love to get Joseph Henrik and, and Ken having a, a chit chat, but uh, that's a, that's a big topic for another time. And I think we have a couple more questions. We have maybe time for one more. Yeah, a couple, uh, maybe a couple maybe more. A couple more. Um, Yossarian, your question has as many upvotes as everyone else, but I like it. So I'm going to choose it. <laughs> Hi, let me um, refine this question. I didn't actually think it was a great question, but thank you, David. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, my question was essentially, and I've noticed just this even in myself, I got into Ken in the late 90s reading uh, A Brief History of Everything, and it blew my mind. And I was like, wow, he sees the world like I do, but it was probably more he sees the world like I'd like to. <laughs> and um, so I noticed, I mean, just to give context to this question, rebel wisdom has been, and the IDW to some degree has been kind of a, a bit of a red pill for me being a long time progressive. And um, so I'm seeing the shortfalls of some of the left and that's helped me, I think, be more moving towards tier two as an example. I, I'm not claiming that's where I'm at, but that's where you know, after becoming a fan of Ken's, you'd kind of go like, that's where we're heading. That's where we should all try to get to. So I guess the question that I wrote down was, does there seem to be a lot of people who think they are tier two thinkers, but who are in fact lower on the developmental level? And that clearly just kind of sticks people that are already within the integral movement itself that are familiar with all the terminology that could even, um, I guess, be critiqued on that level. Um, I've heard Ken talk about about that we need approximately, I think he said, 10% of population to be at a certain development level for the entire culture to start moving up into it. And so 
um, yeah, I guess that's the piece that I'm curious about. And, and David's comment about having an allergy to to green or the woke factor or, you know, kind of reflects like where our own personal shadows are blocking us from um, transcending, you know, including those that that piece like we're, we're somehow blocked from moving up because there's something wrong with that stage that we that we sense somehow. I've just put your area enough to put your question in the chat. Um, you cut out a couple of times during it, but I think we got it. I'd actually reframe that. Um, Yossarian's asking whether uh, a lot of people who think they're second tier aren't. I'd actually reframe it. Is there anyone who reads his books who doesn't immediately put themselves into second tier? <laughs> sure, and that's uh, that's not an integral problem, right? That's the general human condition, <laughs> which is we hear about things and we, we imagine it, that we are embodying the things we heard about immediately. <laughs> So there's an issue there. I think there are two ways, at least two strong ways in which people imagine they're at second tier when they're not. The first is they can use the words about second tier that they heard. The second is they had some personal experiences that seem to require transrational, transpersonal, higher level explanations, right? So, but then the test is not what they're talking about or went through the test is how are they talking about it and how are they being with each other so we you know it's it's really important to shift from the content to the style because if somebody wants to yell at you that they absolutely had a transpersonal experience what you need to grade is not whether they had that experience or not but why are they yelling at you where, what level are they coming from in the way they've chosen to express themselves, whether it's about the experience or it's about the terminology? By their fruits, ye shall know them. <laughs> to show that this goes way back, right? You know, um, it's easy to profess. It's not uh, as easy to embody. Um, just the other day, I was thinking about, you know, some of those metaphors from uh, you know, Christian and Judeo-Christian thought, you know, traditional Christian thought that I think are still applicable that, you know, in these related communities to think about, which is, you know, um, functioning as light, functioning as salt, functioning as yeast. Um, how can we as community function as light, basically to illuminate, um, you know, the different issues and problems of our time, the different challenges, the different horizons of possibility? Um, how can we uh, function as salt to preserve what needs to be pre preserved and to bring out the richness and the flavor of all the diversity that's there, um, that they can be better savored and appreciated. And yeast, you know, how can we function as yeast to move into different spaces, into different territories, into different communities, and promote healthy growth, um, expansion, development um, in ourselves and in others and in our relations, in our communities. Um, so I, I just just wanted to throw that in there. I love playing with those, you know, old metaphors and seeing, you know, what what kind of truths can we yield from them right now? So I think we're we're getting close to the end. Have we got time for one more question? Go on. Go on. Go on. Um, got, yeah, that's nice. Clay, yeah, do you want to ask your question? What, in your opinion, is the most helpful resource should someone want to get into becoming the being of integral theory? That's a really neat question. And I would say um, personal relationships with people who are in the community is probably the main thing. But I could also recommend something that I did, which was pick up Ken Wilber books and read the footnotes rather than the text because that's where he's at and those are the nuanced points and that puts you in the conversation he's working on rather than hearing his sort of uh, public facing PR summary. <laughs> I pretty much would you know agree with that in terms of I think entering into these kinds of dialogues is really important. I think the dialogical the everyone's talking about dialogos these days and I think we really need to keep cultivating and practicing that art um, help each other, uh, I think begin to learn to think with our whole bodies and in and in, in, in relationship. Um, 
one thing that worked for me also that I thought was, you know, at least growth producing for me was not only to, uh, you know, read, read Ken Wilber's books, but actually begin, you know, and I think this, this should be actual, this is actual, you know, humani humanities kind of study is actually go to the source texts. You know, don't only rely on these summaries and integrations, but really reach out and read in the areas that are of interest and, and uh, begin to practice your own uh, synthesis. Uh, you know, one of the things that, uh, uh, you know, Benita Roy talks about is that there are many different ways to go meta. Um, and I think you can look at the different ways to go meta and you'll find those reflected in our communities and, and thinking about that is, is really helpful. But one of them is to, you know, um, uh, move orthogonally and, you know, so uh, take whatever your presuppositions are and then move to another space to see what would the world look like if this other um, element was at the center, what I call doing auto choreography, moving around and, and, and trying out different perspectives. What would the world show up like if this was centered, for instance, um, and circulating through that can help you really, I think, you know, digest and begin to synthesize um, perspectives in your own life and, and mind um, in an individual way uh, beyond, you know, just, you know, grokking the model or whatever. The film you just watched was a conversation that happened in Rebel Wisdom's digital campfire. So to join conversations like this, to submit questions, stay for the after hours hangout to talk about the ideas in the films and to practice and develop some of the skills we talk about on the channel, check out the membership options. There's three different levels of membership. Sensemakers get to join our regular Sensemaker showcase events with some of the most interesting thinkers around. And also the monthly Wisdom Gym sessions where we speak to and also have a chance to work with some of the world's best teachers and facilitators. Explorers can join the Rebel Wisdom Book Club sessions, the monthly Philosophical Journey sessions, and also the regular Skills Academy to practice skills like mindfulness, sovereignty, and sense-making. Also, Rebel Wisdom will be at the Inner State Festival in Albania in September, so check out the link below for details. And from now on, all members get to join our monthly AMA sessions with us, where you can ask any questions about anything to do with Rebel Wisdom.